must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Pollan, and today we are joined by an incredibly special guest, and before we actually introduce her, I would like to give a personal shout out um, to Dr. Greg Hartley and Dr. Tamara Gravano for recommending our guest for this evening, as I know that they both have been doing some great work as well, and they recommended Kathy our way, so I was like, absolutely, we'll reach out. Um, so without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Kathy Cholik, who has been a physical therapist for over 30 years and specializes in geriatrics and care for people with dementia. She is also a fellow of the American Physical Therapy Association. She's a business owner and a former assistant professor at the University of Delaware. Well, you know, Kathy, thank you so much for, I know, all the service and work you've done with the, you know, the academy and as well as with everything else you're involved in, because I know we were talking in the pre-show and there's a lot you're doing. Um, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity. Yeah, no, we love it. We love getting different perspectives and especially different topics like these. And you know, before we dive into the topic today, Kathy, so talking more into um, geriatrics in clinical practice, but also in education. Would you mind just sharing a little bit more about yourself, along with maybe your story about how you got involved with geriatrics to kind of where you are now? Sure. So, um, as you said, I've been a, a physical therapist for 30 years this month, actually. And so, um, I started my career as most PTs did back in that time era, which was we were highly encouraged to go to a hospital to start working. Uh, and in the hospital, you could do rotations and get exposure because I actually went to PT school to work with kids. I really thought I was going to be a pediatric therapist. And um, during my time in the hospital, I really fell in love with working with the older adults. It was a, a bulk of the uh, people that I was seeing. And so um, I was there for a few years and did my inpatient acute care, um, rehab, joint replacement, uh, home health rotations that we, we cycled all through the hospital uh, and left to form a home health uh, contracting business with my husband, who is also a PT. And um, through a series of events, we had twins. It was too hard to be on the road. So we each worked our way into a sniff um, as a, either PT, then director rehab, um, kind of position. So over there, I did uh, about uh, eight, eight ish years uh, in skilled nursing facilities and also in a, a CCRC. So in a continuing care retirement community, which was a really an ideal environment. I loved it. That was a great work schedule for me. Um, and I really could impact the care of the community. But uh, with my twins growing up, um, I had the opportunity to join and start a, an outpatient clinic at the University of Delaware. Uh, that was focused on older adults. They um, were looking to expand their practice uh, into a couple different areas. They had a very thriving orthopedic clinic um, that does really well. And so we were trying to get to uh, pick up more of a neurologic and older adult population. So I came in and got that started to the point where all of the students there rotated as part of an integrated clinical experience through our clinic with me and then my subsequent staff uh, who came on board um, and residents that came through uh, being the CIs. Um, I left there two-ish, two and a half years ago to um, really do some grant work working with dementia. It was an opportunity for me to kind of follow my passion uh, and, and change lives more impactfully for a large population. 
So um, since then, our grant stopped, and I started my own business doing the same thing. So I do a lot of education and consultation now. Good for you. And man, it just seems like through your career, you've had a vast number of different kinds of experiences in this realm, which is really valuable because I think that's going to add um, a lot more rich discussion on, you know, some of these topics here. But, you know, before we get into, I know one of your big passions is dementia, but before we kind of get into that, let's back up a little bit and just talk generally speaking about aging. So about more along the lines of healthy aging, but mm -hmm. how would you summarize our society's view on aging? And how do you think that this um, view ultimately affects healthcare as it stands now? Yeah, so uh, it's interesting. In the US, there's actually been some, some research and the impression of a lot of people um, about older adults is that they're others. You know, that this other group of people, that people who are older than me. Uh, Framework Institute is a group that I follow very closely and they were hired to look at social perceptions of aging and um, really to kind of their goal was to help reframe aging. So I've been able to take some of their resources to the academy and we try to use them, uh, their findings to help our work in reframing just PT's own image and perceptions of aging. Because when you other this group, um, anyone over 65, let's just arbitrarily pick a date, you create this us versus them mentality. This other group is taking resources. Um, but it's really othering your future self because um, the one group we can all hope to accomplish is to be this older adult group, uh, hopefully. And so, um, you know, healthy aging is, is more than luck. It's a bit of luck. There's work on the part of the individual and then all those social determinants of health. So we tend to think that it's um, one piece that, you know, it just happens to be good genes or what's your secret to aging. Um, and unfortunately, just a lot of people see it in a negative context. It's interesting that you say that because, you know, and that seems to make sense. And it's unfortunate that some of the things are the way they are. But, you know, I'm curious, does the whole rest of the world have a similar viewpoint or perspective on that? Like how, how does our view, how does society's view on aging differing from maybe other countries? Because I know there are some cultural differences there for sure. Sure. And, and there are some cultural differences and there are some cultures that really value aging and recognize the momentum that they offer, that the life um, and energy that they build up as they get older and has power and the commun move communities forward. Um, but interestingly enough, that wisdom and age and perhaps um, the time that they may have following you know, their, their work life where they have more time if they are fortunate enough to age out of work, um, it breeds more of an automatic respect. Uh, and but most of the developed countries um, are more concerned about the demographic changes that are potentially coming and, and not being as proactive to capture that momentum. No, I mean, that, that certainly seems to make sense. And, you know, Kathy, I know you had mentioned earlier in your intro about um, kind of how I think it's funny how you started off initially thinking you were going to go into peds and then mm -hmm. uh, that actually that ended up not happening and you ended up finding something different because I think. I think I hear that very commonly, actually, with a lot of clinicians. They think they're going to go into one thing, and then they come out of school thinking they're going to go a totally different way, which I, I think is always interesting. Um, but was there a specific story or reason that you really ended up going more towards um, specifically the pe people with dementia in this line of geriatrics? Like, was there any specific um, thing that drove you into that specific niche? So interesting, part of the reason I never thought I would be in, in geriatrics or dementia, so my grandmother, my, my um, mater paternal grandmother, my dad's mom, um, she had Alzheimer's, and, and this was back in the um, 80s, and we didn't know much about it. It was still really um, kind of new to the world, and, um, and, and it was, she was my special grandma. And so, you know, that was, you know, it was really hard. So I was like, I don't want to work with old people. This is awful. <laughs> Who wants to do this, right? And so, you know, when I really kind of found is that I have a, a connection, I have a, um, a way of understanding. And really, the more I learned about it and recognized all the things you can do wrong if you don't know what you're doing, um, it really kind of felt like I have a way to make a connection and I have learned enough um, of reading signs and reading body language and, and getting into the root cause of problems of, of what they're trying to express that as I had the opportunity to work and help do culture change for these organizations and, and really look at, we know so much more now about how to provide really good care for people who have dementia and, and aging in general. Um, that it was worth taking a leap to, to try to go um, do it 
and, and spread the word. And if I have the opportunity to change a few people's thought processes about it, they exponentially can, can change a lot more. Well, I love that. And taking that momentum, let's kind of dive a little bit more into that, to that specific area there. So how in this day and age, how is the diagnosis of dementia given? And let's say, for example, someone who's out there who has a family member or who has a family member or loved one with dementia, what are some, what is some advice that you would give to those family members to best help those people? Sure. So, you know, the, the, Part that's so interesting is, you know, dementia is very much an umbrella term. Um, we have, it, it covers a lot of different disease states that have actual pathology names um, that can cause similar problems. And so our challenge now is that even with an advancing um, medical diagnostics, most people don't get an actual diagnosis of the type of dementia they have. They're just told they have dementia or even worse, they assume that if some cognitive change is just normal aging when it's really a disease state or something that could be fixed. So, you know, we have meds that we know can help slow the decline um, of, say, Alzheimer's type. But those same meds actually have a bad response for people who have Lewy body or frontotemporal dementia and can make their symptoms worse. And so if, if people aren't being an advocate to really understand um, what's going on in the diagnostics, um, our, our tests aren't great. There are better tests coming. Um, there are some dyes now that we can use to, in different kinds of scans. Um, unfortunately, they're still very expensive, so most people don't get that level of testing, except in research studies. Um, but the more we can process of elimination through what it is or isn't dementia, and then does it look like it's more Alzheimer's type or more Lewy body type, um, or something off the wall like a normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is completely reversible. Um, if we can catch it. And so really trying to go and look down. The other thing I see a lot is a lot of depression that is misdiagnosed as dementia. And so the family thinks they have dementia and it's really depression, which we could treat with cognitive behavioral therapy or medications um, or some engagement principles, uh, get them out of the house. And if we do that, then their cognition seems to improve. Uh, and so, you know, what I would say is, if you are a family caregiver um, or a caregiver for someone who you think they may have it, be an advocate. It, it's the new life. It is a new role. Um, and uh, be their Sherpa or their advocate, however you, you kind of want to look at it. But they're going to need somebody to help navigate a system that is complex and complicated and um, unfortunately has a bias against people who have this disease so that they don't always get to make decisions on their own. So, you know, going out and trying to find the best way to engage them and keep them active um, is really important. Well, and I think it goes back to what you had met, said initially is actually making sure like the diagnosis is correct. And, you know, if, if we could, I want to dive a little bit more into that realm because I recognize that there might be um, some clinicians out there who maybe don't see this that often. Um, so you had mentioned some of the other differentials such as Lewy body, hydrocephalus, depression, and some others too. Um, but you know, since we always need to be on the lookout for this, what are some of the key um, distinguishing features, shall we say, of each of those common differentials to best kind of help give clinicians um, a good scope to look through to best help catch some of these things at the appropriate time frame? Sure. And so, you know, there are some quick and easy screening tools that are really just going to say whether there's um, some cognitive impairment or not. Um, the um, Some that you can use that don't take much time, like the MOCA is kind of one of the standards that I use. It takes a little bit longer, um, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, it, but it's one where I can start to dig down into lots of different components. So if you think about cognition really being, it, it's everything from um, memory, which is what most people associate with a dementia. Um, memory is a big component of Alzheimer's type. Um, it, in fact, it's one of the main factors. So you have to have some difficulty with recalling new information and some other changes like language or word finding changes or facial recognition or some piece of executive function like your ability to plan a trip or navigate um, a route. Um, those are, are your more typical Alzheimer's type presentations um, versus dementia with Lewy body, which is closely related to the Parkinson's um, kind of family. And there's some um, question of how much they're related. But what we see in dementia with Lewy bodies is um, impaired emotional regulation. Um, they may be some memory problems as well. But one of the first signs of um, people may see is a sleep regulation problem. Um, so they're going to have trouble sleeping. 
um, as well as perhaps some motor signs that start to look a little bit like Parkinson's. And then frontotemporal is um, one of the less known, but actually more common in young people. So it, it might be one people see in a younger population. Frontotemporal has a bunch of variants as well. Um, there's a behavioral variant where we see like disinhibition, um, apathy, uh, loss of empathy or social confidence. So they, they just start not knowing how to navigate the world the same way. And some loss um, of executive function here as well, and that they um, sometimes make judgment decisions that aren't um, normal judgment decisions, we would say. Um, and there's some other language variants. Um, and some of those, you can see some movement pieces, which may present a PT. So muscle stiffness, um, they have slow movements that kind of looks like they're walking through water or jello. Um, so those are like those are the three main types. You can get into vascular, which is kind of related to um, stroke, mini strokes throughout. And then there's mild cognitive impairment, which is on the scheme of we don't know where. Sometimes it progresses to a full Alzheimer's dementia, and sometimes it doesn't. There's a, a distinct percent of the population that might only ever get mild cognitive impairment and never move on to a full dementia. Um, then there's all kinds of there's hun there are literally a hundred subtypes. Those are the four most common um, that we really see. And so they're the um, ones we have the most data on. So that being said, I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of curious. I know this kind of goes back a little bit, but I think it's still good to kind of just get an overview and a brief review on this is, you know, in terms of basic physiology and what's actually happening anatomically when we're talking about dementia, um, specifically, what do we know or what do we know new, now know about what's kind of going on there? And is there any way to prevent our lessons of chances, lessen our chances of developing um, any form of dementia from even starting? So there, there is certainly some genetic component, right? So that's something we don't necessarily have a huge amount of um, control over, but it's actually very small. So in, in Alzheimer's type specifically, there is about a 1% of people who have Alzheimer's type, which is a, a familial genetic early onset. So they um, are, may see their symptoms in their 30s. Um, it is, if you have that gene, you will get it. Uh, and, but it is a very small portion of it. Um, the rest, there is an APOE gene, which is, means you have a greater likelihood of doing it. But what we have some data on, and in fact, some of the rates are showing that there's a slowing of the decline uh, of how many people are slowing of the number of people who are getting dementia. Um, and part of it we think is partially due to better nutrition. Um, certainly some low fat, uh, the Mediterranean diet has been associated to some degree with better cognition over time. Uh, that's one of the social determinants of health piece, right? If you have good access to food and good healthy food, um, and also as you have a diet that kind of um, cuts down potentially on some of the uh, inflammation, the, we, there is growing data we don't fully understand between the gut and brain connection. Um, that seems to perhaps link to the start of plaque formation um, that leads to symptomatic Alzheimer's type. So some of the diets, if you can avoid things like people who have um, diabetes have a higher risk, people who have cardiovascular disease have a higher risk of dementia. So all those things that will avoid diabetes and cardiovascular disease will increase, improve your likelihood of not getting a dementia state. But also engagement, staying active, um, both mentally and physically, having a reason and a purpose seems to have a protective factor. Uh, and so there is a, a growing body of evidence that looks at physical activity and exercise as a preventative um, piece of data to s slow it, if not stop it from occurring. If you look at the target data, though, we don't know exactly when. Um, a lot of the plaque formations are believed to be laid down in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, but don't necessarily show up to the 70s or 80s. So where we either do drug trials or where we do exercise trials, um, it, we need to look at really long-term studies to be able to say, because um, what we know is there is so much damage done before you ever show the first symptom of dementia, um, that it's very hard to do good drug trials. So uh, that's kind of what we know from prevention, certainly avoiding concussions, um, avoiding head injuries. There is pugilistic um, onset of you know, head trauma that leads to a potential for cognitive impairment as well, um, not necessarily any particular form of dementia. 
Right. And I mean, I know that's been a huge thing looking at professional athletes with development of CTE and, Mm -hmm. you know, and you had talked about a couple of things earlier, Kathy, and I know the more at least, you know, as an orthopedic therapist primarily now and treating mostly um, a lot of individuals in persistent pain, one other factor that seems to come up at least from that, is also sleep hygiene. And mm-hmm. do you find that sleep hygiene, do we know from a data standpoint how that plays into this role of you know, developing problems of cognition later? So they, they think there may be a relationship with sleep apnea um, to some level of cognitive impairment. Now, we know in the short term, there is at least you don't function well when you don't sleep. Um, but over time, they think that also could be some cumulative trauma Um, that is leading to a worsening cognitive function and perhaps related to different forms of dementia. So CPAP is really important if you, uh, you know, if you're not sleeping well or if you're noting that you're snoring. In fact, so I'm part of um, a study that's just tracking people over time. And so every six months I have to like, you know, does your, does your partner say you snore? (laughs) Like there are, there are their assessment of your sleep quality questions that they're using to track. This is a long-term study. They're tracking people over decades um, using online assessment tools. Gotcha. And have they looked at anything regarding people that just have poor hygiene or insomnia, or are they mostly just looking at people with apnea? So the relationship has mostly been shown to be like, if you can reverse the sleep apnea, it seems that we've already seen data that the cognition improves. Um, And so there is some thought. um, I know of at least one um, anecdotal case uh, who was a family member um, that once He's, they were going to the gym and they also started using a CPAP and never progressed beyond mild cognitive impairment. And so, uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of um, potential connection there. I mean, it, it makes sense. I mean, just given, I mean, the more we're just learning about sleep and all these other lifestyle factors and things that, you know, are really actually really simple when we think about it to some degree, but also very difficult at the same time. So, mm-hmm. I, you know, apart from, you've mentioned a lot of good tips on on this, but I want to kind of gather and see what are some of the biggest mistakes you see, um, whether that be newer or experienced clinicians make when treating older adults, and what advice would you give to those clinicians to really help make the best care for um, people that are older? So when I when I teach clinicians about dementia, you know, there, there's nothing magic about our techniques that's different than working with anyone else, right? We're, we're going to try to use exercise to improve strength if that's what they need. We're going to try to work on improving balance if they have balance issues. The difference is, is how we communicate and get somebody who is perhaps more difficult to engage to do the things we want them to do um, to be able to get better. And so, you know, looking at their ability to communicate um, they may be less verbal. They may have a harder time understanding your verbal. But there is, um, Stephen Sabat is a psychologist a psych- um, who looked at, there is a, um, we're learning how much more they understand from body language. Um, that So how you communicate to somebody who has dementia is very important, not just your words. In fact, it's more in your body language and tone that is likely to get um, agreement or participation out of that engagement. So if somebody, if, you, if you're having a bad day, you need to check that at the door before you engage with somebody who has dementia. Um, mindfulness is another area that I, I, you know, I really emphasize in a lot of my work and just as a clinician. You have to be mindful and present because they will pick up on if you're distracted, if you're unhappy, if you're not engaged with trying to get them, if you're frustrated, and all of that will be reflected back <laughs> to you. Um, and, and it's very hard to get them to do what you want then. And so uh, really trying to figure out how to get them to engage, but also to know them. And the secret I sauce of what I really look at is get to know their history. I want to know what they did for a living. I want to know what they enjoyed doing. I want to know so much about them that I can then take the signs of what they're doing or if their words come out a little bit jumbled and make them into some form of sensical statement. Uh, you know, I had a person that we worked with that we were consulting with who was just falling and falling. The facility was just f- so frustrated. And when we really looked into his purpose of why he was getting up and moving and going into the root cause of what this was, he was just trying to go to work and he was an accountant. And so what the group we were working with did is we set up a desk in the facility. We got an adding machine 
We got him a briefcase and he went to work every day. Got him a nameplate for his desk. And so he would go and work and do look, fiddle around and whatever paper they could give him stuff to do. But his falls were so significantly reduced because he wasn't wandering around aimlessly. He had a purpose again and his purpose made sense to him. Now, it wasn't great for a physical activity because he was then sitting at the desk a lot, but at the same time, he wasn't falling. Um, and so in his world, he, he was content to just kind of putter around his office, um, even in, you know, knowing that that was not his current life state, but that's where he was. And so we had to go to where he was to be able to, to meet his needs. Um, so those are like, when you know them, you can start to gather that information. And it's hard. You have to look and you have to dig and it's more layers of the onion than we'd like to peel as therapists sometimes because uh, we think, oh, we fixed it when we get to this first thing. But like the fall wasn't the problem. The fall was a symptom. We needed to get to what the problem was is he was lost and we needed to find him a home. Yeah. And, you know, and that's interesting that you say that because earlier on, I think it was interesting that you said that one of the reasons why um, you gravitated more towards this specialty was from personal experience with your own family. And, you know, I'd love to kind of dive in and get your thoughts from that perspective, because I, I understand um, hearing a lot of people that have had family members like that. And of course, unfortunately, seeing the rates of abuse being very high among family members. And I, you know, it's, it's horrible, but I can also see why there's definite frustration on family members to a point. Um, how do you best recommend that family members can still care for their loved ones, but also keep themselves in a good position so that everyone moves forward? Oh, it's absolutely a balance. You know, I, the being a caregiver 24-7 is hard work. It is harder than any day we put in the clinic. Um, and, you know, and then you have, if they're up during the night, the other person's up during the night. So, you know, finding and using resources to support what you want to do. Uh, one of the things um, I've started locally here um, as a volunteer to get started is a, a, a memory cafe. It is um, out of our local senior center, and it's an hour where both the caregiver and their partner can come in um, and we just talk about stuff. We, we do free-flowing things, things to trigger memories, things to help um, them connect to a time that's more likely to be remembered than what they had for breakfast. Um, and hopefully it's a time where they can see where their loved one has so much potential still. Um, so we do a lot of stuff with the 50s and 60s and 70s, older pictures, movies, that kind of stuff. Um, and or music, different genres. And so giving them that relief time. So we usually do it as partners so that they can both be there. If, um, but then looking at things like adult day services where you might be able to drop them off and then either nap or run your errands or you do your thing when you have that free time. I think, um, and looking for resources, the thing I find um, that is so hard for families is they don't really understand the disease or what it means or what it's doing to their loved one. And so they expect the same rational answer from somebody that they've gotten across 40, 50 years of their marriage. And Alzheimer's takes away that rationality in a lot of sense. And so they can't understand why they won't just stay in the car while they run into the grocery store. They don't understand why they're doing these odd things um, or wanting to go out when it's improperly dressed. And when you recognize that it's them um, in a different form uh, and that your roles are different now, it's a loss and they, they need an opportunity to mourn that loss and to recognize or adopt a different um, pattern in life, um, maybe than they thought they were going to have. So, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of dealing with that grief, but also trying to be strong and find what they're still good at and encourage that as much as possible. We all look at the losses. Oh, they can't do this anymore. They can't do this anymore. I try to look at what can they still do? And how can we facilitate that um, to maybe, you know, can they set the table? It doesn't have to look pretty, <laughs> right? Or can they help bake and we'll throw that out and cook some other food? Like th there are lots of options if we have those to do, um, but use your support groups and um, your resources and, you know, find there are some great books, Dementia Beyond Drugs, Dementia Beyond Disease, or two books by Al Powers um, that were really life-changing and recognize this is the disease talking at this point. Um, and 
and, and it is a chronic disease that your loved one now has and that you're going to have to change to accommodate around it, not to fix it. We're, we're never going to restore that memory, um, but you still have it and you can talk about it, uh, but, but don't be trying. We get lots of people questioning each other um, and, and questioning to frustration is not helpful. Uh, but let's talk about, you know, you're looking for your mom. Uh, you must miss your mom. What does your mom like to do? What did you enjoy doing about your mom? Not, you know, you're not going to find your mom kind of thing. No, and, th and that makes a lot of sense. And, and Kathy, I know you had talked earlier about some of the things that we know um, from a pre prevention standpoint regarding dementia, regarding, you know, of course, um, diets, exercise, and a few other things as well. Is there a lot of similarity between that and healthy aging? Or is it kind of different? So, you know, healthy aging is um, personally interpreted. <laughs> you know, I think there there is a lot of um, different viewpoints. There's certainly definitions out there. You know, I look at somebody who's aging healthy, and, and I think it's somebody who has resilience. And um, when I see people who I think have aged healthy, I look at, they see resilience and gratitude. I mean, they recognize that their life isn't the same and are still happy for the things that they can do. Um, finding ways to still contribute, finding ways to still be engaged as much as they want to. Um, you know, I, I think people, what I think is important isn't important to everyone. So it's a very um, learning experience for me was a fairly young therapist when I was starting to really start to understand. It's not my goal to make you do X, Y, and Z. You tell me what you want to do and we will see how we can negotiate getting there. You know, many times it's like, we think we know best. Um, we have lots of information. I have suggestions. We can decide if that's the way you really want to go or not. And I can live with your choice. You can have a choice to make poor decisions. Uh, and, and sometimes that's the way it is. But people who are aging well are, you know, using what function they have to the most opportunity they have. And then perhaps accepting accommodations when they can't. Because, you know, resisting those accommodations is as much a challenge um, and you know, certainly not overusing accommodations if you don't need them. It's, it's that fine line of balance of, of doing everything you're capable of. Well, no, absolutely. And you know, that kind of dives in to the next avenue because I know Carol Lewis actually did her uh, McMillan lecture not too long ago regarding geriatrics and she made a lot of good points in her lecture. Um, but I'm kind of curious as where do you see that you know, from an entry level, you know, DPT curriculum standpoint after this lecture, do you feel like geriatrics, um, do you feel like geriatrics is now more so adequately covered in entry level programs or do you think we still have some work to do? You know, having been in a program, it, it, programs are over two and a half to three years and we have a lot of stuff to cover. You know, I, I was fortunate to serve um, AGPT several years ago, put together a task force, and we made recommendations for entry-level curriculum uh, that what it should cover for geriatrics. And we were very um, specific not to say how. Like it could be one course, it could be spread throughout the curriculum, you know, if it's a problem-based learning. However you choose to teach, these are the kind of things we thought were important. And it kind of goes back to, it's again, some tests and measures are covered in other places, right? So neuro curriculum covers a lot of stuff on Parkinson's and different areas. Ortho curriculum covers a lot of stuff on the more orthopedic side of aging. Um, but how, if you're teaching Jerry well, you're really looking at, you know, what are the, between the cellular and system level changes and how does that impact everything you've already learned to date? Like now you've no exercise, how is it different when you're working with an older adult? You know back pain. How is it different when you're working with an older adult? What are the communication and sensory changes that may interfere with your interaction? You know, sometimes they're considered soft skills um, in a lot of places, and they may not be seen as having as much value. So some places do it really well, and so they do a great geriatric curriculum. Other places don't, um, and maybe it's because it's, it's either not valued, it's not by taught by somebody who really understands aging, sometimes I think it can be delegated out, it can't be, you really do need to understand um, all the pieces, but you know, are you looking for things like depression, are you doing case application, are you taking like, that was one of the things I really felt like I was able to do was to take, um, I had my students with cases, they followed the same person across the semester, and that case would change based on what we learned in class. 
now that you know about this, here are some different pieces of information. How is that going to change your, your um, plan of care for this person? What do you need to do now? Oh my gosh, they've had a fall. What are you going to do for interventions? So really looking at that whole person piece, that to me is what I think geriatrics is. And what I think we, we sometimes as new clinicians get very focused on the referral problem. Um, and so they were sent here for a wrist fracture. Well, why did they get the wrist fracture? They got the wrist fracture because they fell. That's really the problem we need to be addressing. We can work on range of motion and we can work on strength and all those pieces to get that back. But if we don't fix what originally caused the system error, so to speak, they're just going to come right back or perhaps have a big problem that leads them to not be able to live at home anymore. And so, you know, our worldview is different from working with athletes. It's, it's no less, no more. It's just different. And so, but I think our, what we do is just as important in keeping someone living at home to the whole healthcare system, to the whole United States system. Every dollar we save not putting, having someone needs nursing home care is, is, is good for our nation. And so how do we really work to help keep people living longer and healthier lives? It to me is, is um, it's a public health issue that we need to address. Right. And given, of course, the number of baby boomers that will be coming up in the near future, and of course, you know, that pop, the population changes that may, that are going to be taking place. And, you know, given that, Kathy, and what you had mentioned, of course, regarding entry-level education, do, what, do you think that geriatrics in terms of coverage on the MBTE is adequate? And do you think that um, the current CAPTI standards regarding that are appropriate, or do you think they should change more? So it's really hard to test in a multiple choice format some of this pieces, you know, and so I think in the MBT is every time somebody does a, you know, they do the study and somebody marks they do ultrasound, it means we all have to have ultrasound and, and cap to requirements still and, and in the test. And, you know, when I remember the last change in the breakdown that came out um, of the MPTE and it really took away a lot of what I considered the softer side it, it, and maybe they moved them, but it was things like um, understanding communication motivational interviewing, how to get somebody engaged, how to um, be able to talk to somebody. Like those are hard to assess in multiple choice formats. And I really get that. And, and I think they assume that we've done that in clinical education. But at the same time, you know, when you look at the breakdown, they took a lot of those pieces out and really moved into more just tests and measures um, and, and systems-based kind of questions. And so I, I don't know I'm not sure geriatrics is adequately covered, but I also recognize that there's only so much you can do in entry-level education. And so if we can at least get some really good basics down of those pieces of how are you going to talk to them and how to engage with them, how do you recognize your own bias and what you may think that somebody's not capable of just because you don't think older people can do it? You know, are we talking about SEX? with our older adults who have back pain, you know, like that doesn't mean you don't have those questions. And so, you know, working our sort of bias against our own aging um, goes back to the ageism piece. And if anything, I would probably want to talk to just getting more PTs to recognize all that older adults are capable of. So we're serving them best uh, when we're out in the field. Yeah. And one of my, I'll, I'll be honest with Kathy, one of my biases that I tend to find for some clinicians, not all by any means, but there is definitely sometimes a tendency to underload the geriatric population. Mm -hmm. If we're not loading people sufficiently, we're not going to get the adaptive change that we need to really help them progress forward. So mm -hmm. that's just one of my personal, uh, shall I say, things that grinds my gears. <laughs> <laughs> Part of it is from a you know a world of growing up with aging is bad, bad, you know, like all these bad things happen to you and, you know, mm -hmm. like, that all these frail people, we have to take care of them. I mean, that was very much the healthcare world for a very long time. And so, you know, we didn't know overweight older adults because, oh my gosh, if you hurt them, that was awful. But now we know, you know, that there's good data that shows that you, they can gain strength with the appropriate resistance models, just like anyone else. Now that resistance model may be appropriately rationed across where they are, right? You know, maybe that two pound weight is really 80% of their one rep max. That may be a little hard to imagine. <laughs> maybe it's even 40% of their one rep max. Okay, you know, I can get there. There are times where lower weights are appropriate. 
right? But it ha- can't be that everybody gets them. And so this image of the one pound dumbbell, which is one of the you know like ones that photographers really like to use, um, is just not the greatest starting point. You know, really getting in and um, Del R- Avers wrote a white paper several maybe a decade ago now, uh, really looking at what are the strength training principles we should use for older adults. And, um, and I think it's getting out there. I know I teach as part of the CWAA course that the Academy of Geriatric gives are it's all about exercise principles for older adults. And we spend a lot of time working on how do you properly dose? Yeah. And you, you would, you know, your company that you had kind of made, you know, living well with dementia LLC, you know, would you mind just sharing a little bit more detail on specifically um, what the company does and how you're able to continue to make the outreach that you are making? Yes. So um, what I do is predominantly do education. Uh, so I, um, I do education at whatever level organizations need. So um, my preference is always around dementia. Uh, but really, if you're looking anything that the, uh, would be appropriate within a skilled nursing facility um, or also to home health within their regs, assisted living, um, and then some individuals, I, you know, I do education for the Alzheimer's Association. But what I kind of broadened my world a little bit. Um, so I do training. So as when states have surveys for nursing homes, and nursing homes and those don't have great surveys. Um, one of the um, things they have to do to fix it is to provide education. So I do education as part of a remedial process um, to really go over what are the rules, how how should they be providing care, what do their own policies say, um, to make sure that it's adopted back again. But I also do um, consultation. So my favorite time to come in is somebody that the staff feels like they've run out of ideas on. Uh, A lot of times it's around falls, sometimes it's around behavioral expressions, like somebody is being combative or agitated and really trying to go into a root cause to see what is the cause of this um, negative expression. Um, Because really behaviors are communication. That's what a behavior is. When they can't verbally say what it is, they're acting out what they're feeling. Uh, And so um, I put on my sleuth hat and kind of go in and try to help problem solve with the facility. And then typically it involves some education to figure out what we've found. And then hopefully if they think it works, how can they do it themselves next time? Um, we've, as a group, just seem to come to uh, electronic documentation systems that have drop-down menus that have 10 options of things to put on when someone has a fall. Um, and when they run through the 10, they are like, we don't know what else to do. <laughs> and none of mine are going to be on a drop-down menu. <laughs> so we're going to sit and we're going to problem solve and, and really try to come up with, and if that doesn't work, let's try again. You know, like we have options A, B, C, let's work our way through it. Um, and no two would look the same because no people look the same and their needs are all different. The other thing I've been doing is um, doing with the new nursing home payment system that's coming into place in October. Um, I was uh, fortunate to be added to a faculty to, that does statewide training. Um, so I've been busy doing that for the last couple months to help mostly look at things from a person-centered care perspective. Um, this whole system is about providing um, person-driven payment and and it's going to change how care is provided in that group. And so I hope I can um, keep it back to the person at the center of the care uh, and getting people oriented to, you know, yes, it's about dollars and how you're paid for it, but it's also about doing it right. Um, And trying to show people some different ways to think out of the box with how we, we do it right. I love it. And I just love all that you're involved in and really pushing this realm forward and making positive contribution. I mean, it, it's, it's astounding. I love it. And, and, and Kathy, I know we've talked a lot about, you know, geriatrics and we've talked a little bit about education throughout this discussion, but, you know, as we wrap, we kind of like to finish our every single episode with this final question, because, you know, us being called the healthcare education transformation podcast, of course, we have to ask this question. Now, if you want to say something that you've talked about earlier to reiterate it, or if you want to choose something totally different that we haven't talked about yet regarding this, feel free. The sky's the limit. So the question is, if you could change one aspect of healthcare education, um, whether that be physical therapy or other healthcare provider related, which aspect would you change and how would you change it? So 
This is the question because you sent me them before, which is very kind. Thank you. That really had me the most stumped. I had to spend a little bit of time thinking about it. So I really appreciate knowing this one again, as always in advance. Uh, you know, and what I really came down to is that um, we, we as healthcare providers, so even beyond PT, um, we're working on other humans um, and humans who've had lives before they met us and hopefully have long lives after they leave our care. Uh, and remembering that we're working with humans versus treating OA or treating Parkinson's disease, because um, I think that's where we fail our clients. So how do we return the humanism to healthcare? Um, I do think it's an education and putting as much emphasis on learning to take a history, um, linking every medication to a diagnosis and, uh, you know, recognizing when it's still effective. Uh, that medication, um, listening for the real problem and not just the reason they were sent to you. Um, all of those um, are really important. I do think one of the things I was very proud of to work in integrated clinical education where the faculty were the clinical instructors, we really were able to do that. We were um, forcing them <laughs> in many ways uh, to bring it real, make it real, bring it back down to the, what that person needs. And, you know, balancing those qualitative skills, I think, with the quantitative, how to do a test and measure, um, as I think we just really need to have a better blend of the two to really reflect good holistic care. I love it. And then, of course, the hard part is where do we find that optimal balance between the art and the science? <laughs> exactly. You know, that's one thing that I know a lot of students have mentioned as well, feeling more so prepared on the science aspect of patient management, but not necessarily the um, soft skills, the interaction, and the humanity component of it. So, and you know, as being a clinician, I can tell you it's a good amount of both that are needed to be successful. And I think that's a very, very good point and very relevant point. And you know, Kathy, I also recognize that given the breadth of what we've talked about, there might be some people out there that might have questions. Um, where can people find you if they want to follow up with you or reach out to you? Um, should they have a question on, on any of these things? Sure. So my business is um, Living Well with Dementia, LLC. Uh, that's the, my website. It's www.livingwellwithdementialc.com. Uh, I'm also, um, you can connect me through there by email. I'm on Twitter. My work email, Twitter is at livingwdementia. Um, so I'm trying to post stuff on there a little bit more. My personal is at Twin Mom Plus. There's a little bit of politics on there too. Uh, so you can follow me on either. Uh, and you can always get uh, my email and connect with me through the Academy Geriatric PT website. Well, fantastic. And Kathy, again, thank you so much for all that you're doing, all the initiatives that you're continuing to do, pushing this forward. And also, thank you so much for spending the time this evening to chat and share this with our listeners. We really appreciate it. And thank you for it. Thank you guys for all you're doing. It's great. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.